Welcome to worship here at Mount Carmel Baptist Church. We are excited and delighted to have you worship here with us today. We're looking forward to the goodness that God has given us and all the blessings that he has bestowed upon us on this first Sunday in the springtime. God has been good to us. If you would, wherever you are, if you, if you can, please stand and just, just say, God is great and greatly to be praised. One more time, God is great and greatly to be praised. Join me in prayer if you would. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. God, we thank you for life, health, and strength. God, we thank you for things that we sometimes consider the simple things, but they mean so much to us, and if we didn't have them, we would notice the deficit in our lives. But more than that, God, we thank you for your love, your spirit, your grace, and your mercy that continue to surround us and carry us week to week, day to day. And God, we pray that as we receive your spirit, that in terms we share it the same way in which you have given it to us, God. We love you. We depend on you, God. All things come from you. And we thank you. We thank you for those things. God, for whatever measure of health, we thank you for that. Whatever style and lifestyle we live in, God, we thank you for that. Whatever economic success or where we stand in need of, God, we thank you for that. And now we come to offer our praise, our worship to you for all that you have given to us. So bless us in this time of sharing we ask that you would bless our pastor as he brings forth the word that you have given him for us. God, we pray that this day in this worship will be remembered and that we will worship you with all of our hearts, our minds, and our souls. It is in the name of Jesus the Christ we offer this prayer. And the church said, amen, amen. God is great and greatly to be praised. We thank God for this day. And now let us prepare for our scripture today. It'll be coming from Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Acts 9, verses 1 through 6. And the word of God reads as thus. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now it's time for giving. That time and service where we give back to God a portion of what he has given to us. God loves a cheer for giver, and I, I pray that it is with that, that cheer and that joy that you give back to him. Here at Mount Carmel, there are several ways in which you can give. You can give through Givelify. You can choose to mail it in here at Mount Carmel Baptist Church, 7237 Tucker C.G. Road, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28214. 
you can bring it by in person or you can go to the website, mcbaptist.org, and give online. Either way you choose to give, we'll be delighted and we'll accept your gift, your offering that you have given unto the Lord. So with that offering in hand or that offering in mind, what you plan on giving, let us thank God and pray for that offering. God, we thank you for these gifts that we have, a portion to give back to you for all that you have given to us. God, we know that what we give does not add up to what you've given us, God but we give it in the spirit of love, in the spirit of caring, the same spirit that you have given us all the gifts that you have given unto us, God. And we pray that these gifts may be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom to bless the people who have come to serve you and God also to bless the people who don't even know you at this moment. We pray that you will stretch these blessings that we give to cover many, just as you have always done. We thank you. We thank you for the one who will give out a great abundance, and we thank you for that one who will get, give out a great need. Bless us now and bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. And now it's time for worship. If you would, clear out a space in your room. Clear out an area where you can lift holy hands and give praise to God as our music ministry comes to help usher us into the presence of God on this day. We enjoy you and we hope that you enjoy this service. Enjoy what's been planned for you by God as our pastor delivers this word. And I thank you for the opportunity to be here with you. God bless you, Mount Carmel friends and family. favor in your sight Lord please hear my heart's cry I'm desperately waiting to be where you are I'll cross the heart desert I'll travel near or far for your glory I will do anything just to see you to behold you as my king for your do anything just to see you to behold you as my king oh lord if i find favor in your sight lord please cry I'm desperately waiting to be where you are I'll cross the hardest desert I'll travel near or far for your glory I will do Just to see you, to behold you as my king, for your glory, I will do anything just to see to be where you are I gotta be where you are 
Lord, I want to be where you are. I got to be where you are. I said, I want to be where you are. I got to be where you are. Lord, I want to be where you are. I got to be where you are. Said, I want to be where you are. I got to be where you are. I want to be where you are. I got to be where you are. For your glory. I will do anything just to see you, to behold you as my king. I want to be where you are. I got to be where you are. Lord, I want to be where you are. I gotta be where you are. Oh, 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 oh. oh I want to be where you are. Seated at your feet forever at your feet. Oh. Welcome to worship. Thank you for joining us today. Turn with me to our scripture this morning, which is taken from Acts, the ninth chapter, verses one through eight. Acts, the ninth chapter, verses one through eight. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and ask him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now he was going along and approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but they saw no one. When Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and the privilege to share this word of faith. And we pray it will be a blessing as you have designed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today I want to focus on this third verse that says, Now he was going alone and approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And for a subject, I just want to talk to you from the subject, God is bringing me back. God is bringing me back. He's bringing me back. We're told that as they were approaching Damascus, that a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard the voice, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? The context 
of the text is that Saul had been present as they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their feet at a young man, at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, Stephen the faithful, it was hot. It was very hot. The heat was turned up and the small enclave of believers were known as the people of the way. A zealous Pharisee named Saul was becoming more and more emboldened, fresh off the fevered crowd who had stoned, who had stoned to death one of the followers, Stephen. Now Saul had set his sight on the full persecution against the church in Jerusalem. The apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Men gathered together, devout men gathered together and picked up the body of Stephen and we're told they buried him. And all the time lamenting over his death. This is the height of Saul's influence. This is the height of Saul's power. Saul has become the chief persecutor, ravaging the church. We are told it was so bad he went from house to house entering the church. And you recall that in the first century, the church was not large institutions or large buildings. The church was simply from house to house. It had its origins in the houses and homes of its followers, in the houses of friends and family and loved ones who had experienced the saving grace of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Paul, Saul, who, who would become Paul, he appears to us first in Acts. and He appears to us in this terrible view at the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr. We're told that Stephen was stoned and Paul or Saul sat and stood silently watching and approving. And in doing so, he begins to elevate himself. His zeal for persecution continues to rise. Paul's passion and zeal was to go after those who blasphemed God. His quest was to eradicate the church and to destroy this young movement that is known as the people of the way. We're told that in his zeal and power, he is on his way to Damascus. And on his way to Damascus, an extraordinary life-altering transformative event takes happen, takes place. Let's recall who Saul was. Saul the persecutor, the expert in Jewish culture and language. Saul reared in Tarsus, meaning he was well spoken. He was familiar with Greek culture and Greek philosophy. He possessed the privileges of a Roman citizen. He was trained and skilled in Jewish theology. He was excellent in commerce and trade as a tent maker. Saul had the zeal, the leadership qualities, and the theological insight, all the things that were necessary to be a great leader. Saul had the essential qualities before he ever met Jesus. Even though he was on the wrong side of the God question, he had accumulated everything God needed to use him as a great instrument, as a great herald, as the chief imprinter of Christian theology in the first century and even to this day. And so Saul's past prepared him for his tomorrows. And I want to remind you that there is nothing in your past that is ever wasted, that when God is preparing you, and you may not even know what God is preparing you for, but you are in preparation. It's like being the 
uh, on the pot of the potter's wheel. He's shaping and molding your life into what it shall be. And so my past preparation has set me for my future for tomorrow. And even though he's on the wrong side of the God question on that day, God has the power to change it, to turn his life around and put him on the right side of the God question. And so one of the things I've learned about faith is faith requires extreme patience. And it requires extreme patience with people. And it requires that we do not look at them and seek to determine their outcome. Because you don't know in a moment, in a flash, God can turn somebody's life around. God can turn their attention around. They can be involved in some of the most craziest stuff. And in a moment, they can find revelation and conviction and turn that life around and start going in a totally different direction. That's what happened to Saul. Saul was changed. Somebody type it in. Saul was changed. When we sing that song, I've been changed, I've been changed. The actuality is we have been changed. We may look the same on the outside, but I would even argue that when we are changed in Christ, we even begin to look different. We dress different. We talk different. We carry ourselves different because the change becomes so real. It's so much a part of us. It just oozes out of us. This is what's happened to Saul. Notice that Saul both heard the voice of the Lord and that Saul saw him. Now, there's no explicit statement here that says Saul was seeing Christ. The implicit reference is that he sees a light from heaven. The light from heaven is blinding. And so as the light blinds him, the crucial question of the text is raised. Why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? And in that question, he, he responds with, well, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus, and you are persecuting me. Why do you persecute me? And so here we have a great glimpse of a tremendous lesson, because in actuality, Saul did not drag Jesus out of houses. Saul did not uh, stand uh, at the cross and they laid the coats of, uh, of, of, the, of the, uh, those who killed Jesus at his feet. No, what Saul was doing was Saul was dragging believers out. And Jesus said, why do you persecute me? And so here you can see the connection that when the work that takes place in Acts happens, as I mentioned in the past, it goes from Jesus to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles, and then to us. There is no break in the chain. And so the work that we do today is simply the continuation of what Jesus started a long time ago. And to afflict the believing community is to afflict Jesus himself. To afflict the believer, to afflict the believing community is to cast that same affliction upon Jesus. Saul, Saul why are you persecuting me? By persecuting the believer, you are persecuting God. In other words, God is wounded. God is wounded when you wound God's people. Somebody write that down. God is wounded when you wound God's people because God has invested in God's people. And so here, what we see is God giving Saul a tremendous opportunity to take his past and turn it into his promise, to take his pain and turn that pain into the plan of God. 
And I want to say just a little bit about pain because when we are in pain, so often we think that God has neglected us or that we're outside the care of God. And many times when we're in pain, God does some of God's greatest work. God does some of God's greatest glory. And what happens is that we have to understand that our pain that we experience is bringing us into our greater, our fuller purpose. So when God takes our pain and it turns to pressure, which turns to power. So read Isaiah 53, 4 and 6. Surely he bore our infirmities and carried our diseases, and we are counted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed by our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that was made, that made us whole, and, and by his bruises we have been healed. Somebody type in, God's taken my past. God's taken my brokenness. God's taking my pain. And out of that, God is fulfilling my purpose. There's no part of your journey, no part of your experience that has been wasted. You've got to get to the place where you understand, even when you're going through great challenges, you may not desire to go through it, but you can say, Lord, I know you love me and I know that you're going to bring me through this. I don't know why I'm going through this. And sometimes you can't figure it out. I like the way Jake says, he said, don't try to figure it out. He says, survive it, survive it, survive the pain. When you go through the pain, I'm going to come through this. I'm going to make it to the other side. And when I make it to the other side, I will have clarity about what has happened to me. And I will see the witness and power of God in the land of the living. I love that testimony. I'm going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. You have to purpose that in your mind. You have to purpose that in your heart. You have to purpose no matter what you're going through that I know that God is good and I know that God is working on my behalf and I know that God's going to bring me through this and I know that there's purpose in my pain. There's purpose in my pain. There's purpose in my pain. There's purpose in my suffering. There's purpose in this cross experience. There's purpose in me being stricken blind in the, on a road to Demaeus. There's purpose. God is not through with me yet. It's the point where you think Paul could have said, it's over. I'm through. I've done all I can do. It's over. It wasn't the end. It was just the beginning. Somebody type that in. It's not the end. It's just the beginning. This thing I'm going through, this pain I'm experiencing, this challenge I'm experiencing, it's not the end. It's the beginning of something new. It's God turning my past, turning my pain, turning it into greater purpose. It's not my end. Tell your neighbor, it's not the end. It's not the end. It's not the end. No, God is bringing me back. It's not ended. No matter who counts you out, no matter who says you're not going to make it, no matter who tells you to give up, do like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. He's bringing me back. I'm coming through. It's not the end of my story. Think about Brother Joseph, how many times he could have declared it's the end of the story. When he went to see his brothers and they stripped him of his coat of many colors and threw him in a pit, he could have given up and said, that's the end of my story. But something inside of him held the reins. Something inside of him would not let it go. Something inside of him. So this is not the end of the story. When he was sold into slavery on a caravan, going to Egypt. 
That would have been a good point to, res to resolve and to resign and say, this is the end. He said, no, this is not the end of my story. God's bringing me back. This is not the end of my story. When he was there and he was in Potiphar's house and falsely accused, he could have said, after all I've been through, and yet here I am, this is the end. No, it's not the end of the story. When he then gets put into prison and there interpreting dreams, he could have said, that's the end of the story. But no, he said, that's not the end of the story. But love, this is not the end of your story. COVID's not the end of your story. Sickness is not the end of your story. Heartbreak is not the end of your story. Death is not the end of your story. No, 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 no. Bankruptcy is not the end of your story. Loss of job is not the end of your story. No, you're going to come through it. You're coming through it. There's more on the other side. God has that's a greater blessing for you. Joseph could have given up. He could have said it's over, but no, through his pain, he said, God is bringing me back. God is bringing me back. Look at Paul on the road to Damascus, struck blind, knocked off his beast, persecuting the Christian, persecuting the church. He says to him, Paul, just follow the instruction. Somebody will take you by the hand. It's not the end of the story. I came to tell somebody today, rather you're Joseph in a pit or Moses at a Red Sea or Peter dealing with opposition. God's going to bring you back. God's going to bring you through. That's the word for today. Your past has brought you to a place, but it wasn't a waste. And I know you've been through some pain, and that pain is leading you through your purpose and then to your power. And that's where Saul's power ultimately was. It was not in being Saul, it was being Paul. And when he had that transformation, when he turned his life around, when he got himself in the right place, he began to experience the power of God. And he could say things like, and we know that all things work together, that all things work together for the good of those who love him and have been called according to God's purpose. Did you hear what he said? Romans, all things work together. Romans 8 and 28, even when you can't see it, God is working it out. Type it out. God is working it out. God is working it out. God is working on my behalf. God's love is working on my behalf. And whatever you're facing today, you have the power to overcome it. Just as Paul saw overcame the blindness, just as he overcame being a persecutor, he now understands on the other side of that pain, on the other side of that pain, that there was purpose in the pain, purpose in the pain, which produced power and the power that he had and discovered was that God was working in all things. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to God's purpose. Beloved, you've been called today to walk and to walk after the purpose of God for your life. And in that purpose, as you walk in it, you'll go through some pain. It's not going to always be easy. You're going to go through some challenges and some resistance. You're going to be like the seed that has to be buried. And for uh, what's in the seed to come out, it has to be buried and it has to be broken open and it will grow. And as it grows, you will see the fruit of God in your life. Your pain will produce greater fruit. And I want you to know that God will bring you back. That's what Jesus did. He was buried, crucified, buried, and then he died. But that was not the end of the story. On the third day morning, God raised him 
We're coming off a resurrection. He raised him. And then he ascended to heaven. And then he's coming back. God will bring you back. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessing of Christ. And we thank you for each person sharing today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. If you have not accepted Christ as your personal Savior, just take a moment and pray this prayer with me and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to your heart. Lord Jesus, I accept you as my personal Savior, and I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I give you glory. I give you praise. I accept you into my heart, my mind, and my spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, please connect with us. We would love to connect with you. We would love to come beside you as a believing community as we seek to make a difference in the land of the living. Let's prepare for communion. It's first Sunday. It's a beautiful Sunday. And let's prepare for communion. Let us join together for communion. The prophet Isaiah has said, though your sin be as scarlet, it shall be white as snow. The apostle Paul admonishes us to let a man examine himself. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to his own soul, not discerning the Lord's body. Will you therefore with me confess our sin before God by repeating after me? O God, o God. before whom all hearts are revealed and no secrets are hid, we confess our past sin, ask for your forgiving grace and healing mercy. Amen. That which I receive of the Lord, that also I deliver unto you. On the same night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, break it, saying, take and eat. For as often as you do this, you do show forth my death and my suffering until I shall return. And likewise, he took the cup and supped, saying, take and drink. For as often as you do this, you do show forth my death and my suffering until I shall return. Let us pray. God, we ask that you will bless now these elements in this moment. We bless all of the homes and families and individuals who share through all of the mediums we thank you, God, because the Holy Spirit is not limited, but is free. And so as we gather today as the people of God, we are so thankful for the privilege to share in the broken body, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. the body and blood of the Lord. The body and blood of the Lord. Let us commune together, the body of the Lord, the blood of the Lord. And the scriptures record, they sung a hymn and came down from that place. Next Sunday is Mother's Day, and we'll be celebrating all of our mothers here at Mount Carmel Church. And we certainly want to extend to you an invitation to come and to worship with us, either at 8 or 1045 live. And we're practicing all the protocols. You are welcome. Let me thank you again for making Mount Carmel your church of choice. I want you to know that you are loved. 
that God loves you. We want to celebrate the journey of life together. And listen, live your best life and have a great and wonderful day. Amen. <laughs>